Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Okay, right, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in to the Smart Property Investment Show. Always a pleasure to have you uh, join us on this journey uh, of wealth creation through property. You just need to pick up the paper at uh, any point or read the internet or wherever you get your news from. And uh, this is a topsy turvy world we live in right now in terms of property. I'm confident, though, of. Despite a lot of the negativity and naysayers in this marketplace, um, I think in this current cycle of property investment, there's probably some good buying opportunities for those investors who are poised and ready to go. They have the right mindset, the right attitude, the right approach to property investment. It's easy to get caught up in the wave of uh, discontent in property right now. You know, watch the TV, and in particular, I tuned into Your Money the other night and um, just caught about two or three minutes of it and, you know, someone's still banning around this this concept of 40% price falls in property. This is the problem with the media when someone says something, everyone catches on to it, particularly if it's doomsday merchant type sentiments and it just can't go away. So people are still banding around this, this 40% reduction in property prices in places like Melbourne and Sydney. Whether you subscribe to that, that's your decision to make. Uh, my personal view on it, uh, if you purchase the property, have been purchasing property, good quality assets over the last period of time, I think you're probably doing pretty well in the Sydney and Melbourne market. Uh, yes, it is a bit of a, a correction, if you want to call it that. You could call it a downturn. You know, there was a piece I saw of someone chatting about the difference between stocks and shares on on a TV show, and they were talking about um, the share market coming off a huge amounts since August, uh, and some organisations like AMP, for example, losing 25% of its value in a little over a day or so, um, and some declines in property of 2 and 3%, and they were pulled in the same basket. So um, how you choose to approach property is your prerogative. Um, how you choose to uh, receive the information you use to make purchasing or selling or investing decisions, um, that's completely up to you as well. I recommend that you uh, seek advice when it comes to property. In the studio today, I have someone who's long been a shares man and uh, hasn't really been a property man very often. It's a nice little easy segue into this conversation with, I'm going to call him a property investor, Matthew Fennessy. He's not investing at the moment. He has done in the past. I've asked him to come to the studio to give us a bit of an insight into uh, what goes on inside his brain when it comes to property investment, a bit of his story as an investor and uh, as someone whose career has taken him in different parts of the world who now calls Australia home. Matthew, how are you going? Thanks for joining us on the show. Yeah, good. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for having me. Do you? I know you're not actively investing in property at the moment. I know you've got an eye towards property, but you also uh, you keep your eye on other asset classes. What's your overall sentiments or feelings towards property right now? I think that you mentioned that I have been a property investor in the past, and mm-hmm. I guess my story would be similar to some people out there who are listening to this, that I caught the market at a good time, rode that market for a little while and then said, you know what, I think this is the top and I'm going to sell and and I got out and it's probably a, it's a regret doing that. But I guess you have to focus on when that next opportunity is. So you're there speaking about uh, whether we call it a correction or a downturn or a dip in the market, whether it's stocks, property, bonds, whatever it is, any investment you need to be looking for that dip to buy. So this recent move in um, in Sydney prices has certainly caught my attention. I guess you know I would I would tune into your podcast to tell me um, where those pockets of opportunity are, rather than just looking at my street or my suburb or mm. my area. You know, if I'm looking at it from an investment point of view you need to approach it from a, a different angle, I guess. Yeah, and I, I want to understand your investment philosophy because it, it's not my job, it's not this podcast job to tell people where to buy. I like to think that we give people information to help support how they go about buying property. And I'm very conscious of recommending and not recommending where people should be spending their money. I'm happy to share where I'm doing my investing at the moment. But a guy like you who have gone in and out of the, the city market, and you, to be fair, um, you probably could have ridden that wave a little bit longer and made a few more bucks, but I think your circumstances um, changed that. But you've got a career in finance, right? You, you work in the finance game. Yeah. So I guess you deal with financial transactions uh, every day. And uh, what, what, what specifically do you do? What's your, what's your sort of background sort of work-wise? So, yeah, I work in financial markets and you know, I, I work in a trading floor environment. Um, I'm looking at swings in markets uh, day in, day out. And I guess the time frame that I'd be looking at would be a lot shorter term than property. Mm. And I think that that's something that it's difficult 
you, you mentioned the the move in AMP the other day. Mm. That move versus a move in property, they are two very different things. And when you try to look at property through the lens of a market's uh, perspective, it's potentially the, the wrong way to look at it. And that's probably something that I have, that's been an error on my part, looking at property in the same way that I do shares or bonds or foreign exchange, um, looking for that that short-term volatility. You don't see the same sort of volatility in property. But I think that the fear in property markets is when you've got leverage, if you're leveraging up, that 2%, 3%, 5% move is that much bigger when it, when it comes to you know, realising uh, that mark-to-market. When you look at properties and investment class versus other as- asset classes, so you talk about bonds, you talk about equities, uh, you talk about fine art, you can talk about fancy cars, you can talk about bottles of wine, they're all Investment classes are all types of assets in some regards. One of the positives of, of property is that, well, negative and, and, and positives is that it's not a very liquid asset as in it, it doesn't, because transactions volume and the speed of transactions is a lot harder than clicking a couple of buttons on a um, on equities, you know, to buy a particular, you know, company on, on EASX, that, that's immediate. You can buy and sell in a heartbeat, whereas property takes a lot longer. So it's not as open to fluctuations. So when you actually get property markets where you start seeing a downturn, often those downturns are more pronounced. And when they come back up, it's normally a lot slower than some of the um, uh, the complexities of vulnerabilities of of stocks and shares. Um, so when it comes to the way you see the world, and you spoke about how you may have that your approach to investing may have been detrimental because you tried to apply your experience from the financial markets into to the property markets. Have you sort of arrested that now, and and now you're thinking about property differently, or you still think in the sort of transactional? way of whether you're, you're sort of trading currencies or, or, or stocks and shares. What have you done to sort of change that mindset for yourself? I think that my mindset previously was on, okay, I need to find a house for my family to live in. Mm. And I think that you need to take that away from any investment decisions, right? Your house is something very different to investing in property. Mm. So that's something that where my mindset has definitely changed. I'm less focused on finding my family house and more focused on seeing this dip and looking at maybe buying into it uh, from an investment point of view. So are you going to touch property again soon or are you going to leave it alone? I'm monitoring closely. (laughs) What does that mean? Well, if if the right deal come across your, your, your desk, you'd consider it. But you're not proactively looking at property right now. I wouldn't say that I'm proactively looking, Mm. but I'm certainly open to the idea of, of getting back in on this uh, move lower that we're seeing. Okay. So so as a as a, an asset class, you think property is a sound investment, yes or no? Absolutely, of course. Yeah, and, and, on, and on what basis though? I think- Versus other asset classes. I think that all asset classes have their place. I think that property as a longer term investment has a history of being a mature, sound, rational investment. I think that the problem with any- move up in asset prices is trying to well and any move down trying to pick the top or pick the bottom is always uh, very hard Mm. i like i said i sold and at the time thought that i had made the right decision but actually it ended up i I regretted that because the the move up continued for that much longer so this this place so so yeah you bought a place in the city market whereabouts was it uh in a west okay and what did you buy at do you remember the the price that you you bought at Half a mil uh, at, for a when, when was this? This was in two thousand and eight. Okay, and and you subsequently sold the property. Yeah. Uh, do, do you remember how much you you received on the on the sale price? About nine hundred thousand. Okay, and you sold that property because I think you mentioned beforehand you moved overseas or something other. Mm. If you still have that asset now, do you ever sort of go and have a look at it and think what it would be worth or could be worth or is worth? It's sometimes? one thing. It's one thing to to mark to market on your existing assets Mm. it's another thing to mark to market on assets that are no longer yours yeah if you if you constantly look at your investments from a 2020 vision uh you know a hindsight view uh well that's just a a recipe for but this is the reality is investing in property right you know it's good to look backwards and say what you could have done or could have done differently but um what, what i'm interested in is that 
I find that property investors, and, and I wouldn't call you a property man. I've, I've, for our listeners, I've known Matthew for a number of years. Um, I wouldn't call you a property man. I'd call you a – whenever I discuss – Investments with you, it often isn't around properties, around different other asset classes, and and what I find with property investors is that often property investors congregate with other property investors, and they love talking about property, and property is their their, their main asset class that they like to discuss the pros and cons and the lefts and rights, the ups and downs or whatever. But you have other people that have um, a passion for other asset classes, often driven by what they do as a career. And I know you sort of worked in FX and all this sort of stuff. When you're with your peer groups, the people that you knock around with at work or or those circles that you manoeuvre within, is there a collective view of negativity towards properties and asset class versus the sort of stuff that you normally would invest in, whether it's equities or bonds? Uh, Because I see this happening all the time, but is that a reality for you? Um, Yeah, You know what I'm getting at. Like the people just don't talk about property. Oh, property's X, Y, Z, crap. Um, We should be investing in, you know, whatever. Look- Sydney is, you know, and and I've I've been as you mentioned I've been overseas for for quite a while. Mm. Um, coming back to Sydney a couple of years ago, you couldn't go to a barbecue, you couldn't go to a social event without the conversation turning to property pretty quickly. Mm. And I think that, and we mentioned before, people looking at their family home as as an investment. You know, that's a lot of the time those people who are who are steering that conversation that way. They're only talking about their their primary place of residence, and that's not an investment. Like you know, that's that's just your 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 home, right? Mm. But it's funny how in the past six months, twelve months, those conversations aren't really coming up as much, right? So just like you don't see equity investors uh, striking up a conversation at a barbecue about you know which stocks they've they've recently bought and and that sort of thing, I think that. Property has been at you know the forefront of people's minds in recent times, but I think that that's changing a bit as people reassess, look at uh, this downturn. Mm. And sure, it's certainly a, a topic, but it's not the be-all and end-all. I, I know people who would identi- identify themselves as equity investors, and I typically don't sit around and talk to them about what stocks and shares they're they're buying and selling, particularly in a in a market which is going south. Right? You know, often people try and uh, uh, they like to talk about the stuff they're doing well rather than the stuff they're not doing so well at. And uh, you know, I, I think property is an interesting one because it's quite democratised. Property is available to every Australian, and I think property is in, in inherently you know, hard-coded into our DNA as, as, as Aussies, you know. Every Australian loves talking about property, what they're going to do, what they're doing, how they're going to do it, what they're going to do next. You don't have the same culture in, in sort of equities or, or bonds or fine art or, you know, currency traders. Uh, they're often a very different type of individual and person with their, with their own culture. And I think that's a good thing for property. It means that, you know, uh, the topic of conversation, it's, it's, it's very open. Uh, everyone has access to property information. There's no mystery I believe, around property as an investment. So when I have a chat with a guy like yourself who is, uh, I would say, sophisticated in their financial knowledge in um, you know financial markets, uh, you have a, a huge advantage over other people that might want to dabble in those, those sort of asset classes most of the time through their, through their super. Um, with your property uh, ambitions, your property objectives, so you're going to so – are you spending? Are you investing elsewhere at the moment in in classes, asset classes outside of property, or you're not doing anything at the moment, or you're quite happy with? Have you got a uh, um, an equities portfolio which which you're trading on? What, what what's what are you doing at the moment? Well, you mentioned uh, fine art and mm. uh, and vintage cars. I, I certainly don't have. Uh, you're not doing that? any of those. No. no. Okay. But uh, you've yeah. got a couple of uh, Monets on the wall <laughs> at home. <laughs> There, there might be a bit of fine wine, but uh, okay. yeah, not so much as an investment. Mm. Uh, in all seriousness, uh, yes, I I mainly focus on equity markets when it comes to financial investments. Mm. And uh, yes, I actively uh, trade in equity markets. Coming back to a point that you made earlier, I think one of the reasons that you, you mentioned that the property investors stick together, you know, uh, want to talk about it's their a bit more investments. Of a community around yeah, property. Exactly. I think. Yeah. You mentioned liquidity um, and how it is that much harder to exit a a property investment versus a a share. Yeah. Right. Like and it's a lot can, more expensive as well to do so to buy and sell property. Absolutely. So yeah. I think the point is you are wedded to that investment a lot more when it comes to 
property versus uh, shares or bonds or mm. you know um, you know on the market side. So I think that my goal um, would be to have a you know well balanced portfolio with investments in equities, in bonds, in property, maybe less so with the fine art and the vintage cars, but even that is is part of a portfolio. I think a portfolio investment approach is certainly a sensible way to to come about things. Putting all your eggs in one basket is never a sensible way of of investing that you you could you could say that that's punting um, if you're if you're always going and tipping everything into one asset class. So with this current market that we're in, uh, in terms of property, I think it's got it's on the lips of everyone, everyone's attention right now. Everyone's talking about property, but it comes down to, um, I guess, how you invest as an investor. And everyone has different risk appetites, and risk appetites are, are often, you know, a product of experience, a product of upbringing, uh, a product of your socioeconomic. Uh, situation, a product of the people that you knock around with. So everyone is different. You're different to to, to how I'm different. Who's different to Sam here? Who who's uh, producing this particular podcast? When you look at an investment as Matthew Fennessy, what what do you see, or, or what's the first thing that comes front of mind for you? Is it what's the return of this thing, thing going to be, or is it going to be what's the dynamics of this investment, or what's the time uh, efforts required for me to invest in this property? How do you prioritize? your view towards a particular investment or asset class? I think that yield would certainly be the the first thing that I would look at. Mm. I would be much more interested in an AMP versus an afterpay touch type equity, mm. right? So just like I think I would be more interested in an – on the property side, now, you know, I'd be guided by someone like yourself on this more, mm. but – Something like a um, an apartment in you know the the North Shore versus an Eastern Suburbs mansion, right? Like mm-hmm. it's the, the the yield that you're going to get from from those two dif- different properties is similar to you know a, a financial stock versus a technology stock, right? Mm-hmm. Like so, a technology stock you're going to get no yield. You're looking for capital appreciation. A finance stock is generally going to have it's, it's going to be a bit more boring on the capital appreciation side, but it's got a more certain high dividend yielding. yield. And this goes back to your point about a more balanced, diversified portfolio. You probably want yielding stocks and shares we're talking about. You probably want yielding stuff as well as uh, capital growth stuff. In, in America, for example, you know, companies out there often don't or usually don't play traditionally um, uh, dividends and stuff, right? It's, it's all about equities markets out there. It's all about, you know, growth stocks. Um, uh, you get companies like um, – you know, Apple, for example, just park huge amounts of cash in just accounts somewhere. It just sits there, right? They're not giving cash back to the investors because the idea is that your stock goes up in value, you sell down, realise your stuff, and move on. Uh, investing in Australia is um, is different, but it's funny that you say yield because it gives me a bit of an insight into how the way you're you're wired and yield for someone it, like property is an expensive asset class. So in Australia, you know, the median price now is I don't know, something like seven or eight hundred grand. Um in Australia in, in sitting where we're recording, it's about a million bucks. It's just shy of it now. It's come down a little bit. So to get in and out of property, even in a city market, you you the minimum you're gonna pay is like four or five hundred thousand dollars for a, a a unit or a house in the suburbs. So traditionally property investors want to achieve both things. They want to Capital appreciation. They also want yield to help pay down the debt um, or cover the debt situation. If you're in stocks and shares, you know you can be investing a thousand or two thousand dollars. So therefore, the yield play becomes even more uh, critical because it is that immediacy about do you get growth, but can you actually get a return on your investment quickly to put money in your back pocket so you can do more with it and build your portfolio that way. Has your portfolio, in terms of your equities, changed much in its makeup over the last? Uh, I guess, uh, how long have you been investing in equities for? To be a decade or so, would you say? Uh, yeah. Yeah, longer. So, yeah, a bit longer. Are you still chasing the same sort of stuff or as, as your approach to the stocks that you that you buy and hold these days evolved? I mean, when I'm just thinking back over my investment career, I would have probably started dipping my toe in the equity market around the dot, dot com uh, boom. So okay. that would have been around... 2000 so it's actually more like 18 years okay um it's nearly two decades it is <laughs> uh, imagine, what, imagine what you could have done if you put that money in property but so anyway we won't go there <laughs> <laughs> but i think that back then i was chasing capital appreciation mm. whereas now i would be 
much more focused on dividend mm. uh, returns. So yeah, I guess my investment goals have, have changed over the years. Absolutely. And how would you do, would you explain or how would you describe your attitude towards risk? Are you a risky investor or are you a conservative investor or you sit somewhere in the middle? Um, I'd probably sit somewhere in the middle. I'm, I'm, mm. I'm comfortable with risk. Um, I know I, I would weigh up uh, the risk versus return mm. and I'd want to see that return you know, before pulling the trigger. So yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see myself as risk seeking, mm. uh, but I also wouldn't see myself as, um, you know, conservative, put your, put your cash under the mattress sort of thing. Mm. And when you look at, uh, property as a potential asset class for you, um, any sort of time horizon when you might dip your toe back in, into property and, uh, what sort of assets would you be looking at? Yeah. I mean, something that we haven't spoken much about here is debt, mm. right? Like the debt side of the equation. Absolutely. And I think that that's- I was going to ask you about uh, leveraging stocks and shares and whether or not you did that, but we can have that have that conversation now. Well, yeah, I guess my point would be that I, like I said, I, I, I want to have a balanced portfolio with all sorts of uh, investments, but I also don't want to leverage up to the hilt. Mm. Um, I don't think that that's the smartest way to to go about it. So I'm, I'm happy to be more- gradual in my approach in in getting into property so you know i would be looking at those units that you mentioned of like you know four hundred thousand, for example rather than looking at buying at the top of the market in central sydney for example and what sort of lvr would you be comfortable with within a property asset you know one of the positives the experts will tell you and i'm not calling myself an expert here by any means but this is what other people have told me is that uh Property is a very attractive asset class because you get the power of leverage and uh, the leverage is off the back of, you know, a bank, a lender taking the majority of the risk in terms of uh, giving you a big chunk of, of the uh, the capital value by way of a mortgage and the fact that it's underwritten by a strong Australian property market and therefore if banks are happy to sort of pony up the cash with you to go into something, it should be a safe safe investment. So people are very comfortable and happy, you know, taking 80 and 90% uh, loans um, for for mortgages. It's a lot harder to get them right now because of the current lending environment. Where where is your sort of risk appetite for for LVRs? Would you be are you happy around fifty? Are you happy around sixty? Or it's a bit of a moot point because it doesn't really matter. You'll you'll cross that bridge when you get there. It certainly wouldn't be eighty or ninety like you say. Mm. It would be down towards fifty. Okay, and and that's just your risk appetite. You're comfortable with that. It means that you've got. 50% of your money in a property, 50% of the bank's money. So if there is a, a shift or change in, in its capital value, you're not finding yourself underwater. Yeah, I think that you know, having li- lived overseas and seen people going into negative equity in places like London and New York, mm. um, that's a very uncomfortable place to be. Or actually even Dublin, for example, like in the Irish property market, seeing the way that investors were – you know, they they had leverage on leverage, you know, as in they, they'd bought their first place and then they'd leveraged up to buy a second and a third place. And pretty quickly when the downturn happened there, they were in negative equity on all three places. Mm. Um, that's a very uncomfortable place to be. You can ride out that storm a lot better if your LVR is that much lower. Mm. And And one of the very irresponsible things that, was going on in a place like Ireland was that they were offering 110% mortgages, for example, right? There's been less of that in Australia. Oh, it's impossible to get. Yeah, we were doing the same thing uh, back here in the early 2000s, right? 110, 113% mortgages uh, on the basis that property is going up. So um, get in now and uh, and don't miss out. And to be fair, some people capitalise on those, those sort of loans and did very well out of it. But if you're taking on debt 90%, 95%, you're not going to get 100% stuff, even 80% in a falling market. You know, it's only an issue if you need to sell the property, you know, if you can hold on to the property and, and cover any short short shortfall in your mortgage payments over the period of time, that's fine. But it becomes an issue if you need to sell uh, and you can find yourself in a pretty negative situation. So you're pretty conservative, aren't you, I'd say? Fair enough. That's, which is okay, you know, and I think the message here is that it's okay to be conservative. You know, you need to be comfortable and – I guess you need to understand and appreciate your own risk appetite and I think you're fortunate that you've had a lot of experience in financial markets so you know your risk appetite is a product of your own experience and your own knowledge and you've invested in that knowledge so if that's where you're happy operating I, my hat's off to you because um, 
It take people. It takes people a lot of time to actually understand where they're sitting. And normally, what I find chatting with people is that people's risk appetite changes when they have an event like negative equity, and it changes their their mindset pretty quickly. But each their own, you know, when it comes to property investment, and uh, you've got to be able to sleep sound in bed at night. And uh, that's the way I measure my portfolio. Is am I thinking about when I fall asleep at night and wake up in the morning? If I am, is something wrong? If I'm not. I'm pretty comfortable with it. So that's the way I summarise it. But anyway, so you're going to get back into the market at a point in time. Uh, any idea where, when, how, timing, nothing at all, not going to give anything away? No, I mean, I absolutely I'm open to it. Mm. But just like I want to pick my timing in the equity market, I want to pick my time in the property market. And I think that there are opportunities arising at the moment in the property market. I think one of the problems with the property market generally is that it's a lot harder to get the real information about where those opportunities are. You talk to any real estate agent, well, they've got a vested interest. You're not getting a a true perspective from them. Mm. You talk to uh, or or you read an an article in the newspaper, well, most of the uh, advertising revenue for that newspaper comes from you start housing. You sound like a cynic, Matthew. No, I, I, I wouldn't. No, I, I don't think I'm a cynic. Mm. I think that I'm someone who wants to see the information. I don't want to just dive headfirst into something without knowing the the full picture, or at least the majority of the picture. And I think that I think that's sage advice for anyone who's listening. You know, is where where a lot of people make errors in property is that they invest on the basis of information they've heard from someone who hasn't got their vested interest in in in, in mind. They're either – And that uh, can happen a, in a any investment. Yeah, absolutely. It happens in every every asset class. There's uh, unscrupulous punters out there stitching people up with um, uh, investments where either they can't afford or they're just detrimental to their financial health and well-being and mental well-being sometimes. So uh, I think, you know, you're, you're – I'm not going to call it conservative in this, but your attitude, your philosophy towards investing is uh, I think a lot of people can take stuff from that. You know, you don't get pushed around by different ideas and and and, and people telling you uh, uh, the next big thing. You're, you're sort of erudite enough to actually know you've got a good smell test on what's good and what's not and you'll make your own decisions. So you know, I think anyone can learn from that. I think it's important to play the long game. Mm. And really, like like the comment that you made, you know, imagine if you had invested in property 18 years ago. Well, you know, property is a long-term investment and there's plenty more years to come uh, in the property market. So, yeah, okay, maybe 18 years is a little bit too long to have been uh, pontificating, but what about in 18 years to come? Let's see where we're at. Are you um, – uh, I'm going to finish this, this question, but when you've got all the information, are you confident make a decision pretty decisively? Yes. Okay. That's an important thing because a lot of people sit around for years and years and years with the what ifs and uh, uh, they just, the procrastination around having too much information, not being able to make a decision really holds them back. So, you know, if you can pull the trigger when you're comfortable to do so, I think that's, a, that's an important thing. I would agree. Mm, nice one. Matthew, thanks for coming in. That was a sort of covered a whole bunch of different things there, but um, I'm sure the guys will think of a good headline for this particular podcast. Maybe the reluctant property investor who's deep down, he wants to invest, but uh, I don't know. I'm sure I'm sure they'll think of a good way to package this up. I think your attitude and philosophy towards investment sound. You know, I think, uh, you know, you, you, you march to the beat of your own drum and, um, you know, that's, you're in charge. You know, a lot of people outsource uh, their decision making in property, and uh, they're quick to blame when things go wrong, and they're happy to claim when things go right. So, um, you know, got to master better your own drum. But thanks for coming in. And uh, when you buy a property, an investment property, we come and come back on the show and have a chat with us, and uh, tell us the anguish that you probably went through in uh, in securing it. Absolutely. All right, nice one. Uh, so look look out for that. I don't know when it'll come. Any any ideas? Can you give us a time horizon? <laughs> no, it's going to be a laugh. All right. Well, it, anyway, he'll, he'll touch base when he does do something and uh, I'll make sure we drag him back onto the show to have a chat about it. Thanks for tuning in today. Um, if you haven't checked it out recently, uh, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au, a new whiz-bang, super-duper 
uh, platform uh, has been relaunched. Plenty of stuff in there, including all the information about our portfolio. So you can see how we're tracking and the way we see the world. Go and check it out, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Uh, if you want to make sure you're first to know what's going on in property and property investment in Australia, every single morning, you can subscribe, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au forward slash subscribe, or just uh, hit us up on social media, Smart Property HQ. Like us, love us, follow us, um, and you'll keep abreast of everything. If you want to come on the show, um, uh, you know, we often get property experts on the show, but we'd like to get stories from investors, sometimes not even property investors, people who um, have a particular uh, leaning towards other asset classes who still see uh, property as a, a favourable asset class, uh, like Matthew here. Come on the show, have a chat with us. We're keen to bring in anyone as part of this community who uh, has uh, views, vision, attitude, up towards towards property. Uh, email the team, editor at Smart Property Investment. .com.au. We'll be back again next time. Remember, hit that subscribe button, uh, five-star reviews. If you like what we're doing, we're just trying to grow this community of property investors so you're all better informed. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. Thank you.